Well, good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me, Chris, at the back? Yeah, but I, I don't really want to use a microphone. It gives me a little more freedom. Um, you may be surprised that it's me that's giving this talk. Unfortunately, uh, Alan Holyoke is not well enough to travel here. And so I only knew that I was doing this uh, very recently. But fortunately, I happen to have known Alan for a long time. I've also been involved to some extent with the development of the collection that I'm going to say a few words about. But of course, if he'd been here, he wouldn't be hearing what I'm going to say next, which is a few words about him rather than his collection. Now, Alan Holyoke was a person, virtually the only person I think I've ever known who got into philately by reading the newspaper on a plane and getting a bit bored. And he saw an advert for an auction. And would you believe it's with the company that's sponsoring this? And it also happened to be that he took a fancy to some of the Queen's collection duplicates, which were being disposed of to finance the purchase of the cover with the 10 penny blacks on, which is now in the Royal Collection. Now, Alan's always been an entrepreneur. And whatever he's done, he's done it incredibly systematically. And therefore, he's left a bit of a trail in the philatelic community. Many people will have met him. If you haven't, he's a very outgoing guy. When he started, I met him, I think, within a few months of him actually taking an interest in stamps. And together with Chris Harmon, who's just had to take a phone call, uh, the pair of us got to know him really well. And whether our advice was good or bad, the results are there in the community for all to see. I think it's incontrovertible that Alan is certainly one of the outstanding students of Great Britain philately today. And indeed, it just doesn't go down to Great Britain, as you'll see from this collection. It involves material from around the world. The collection that uh, I've been asked to talk about is not the first collection in form. That was one on the subject that I've also been concerned with, postal station. His first exhibit of any magnitude concerned Mulready envelopes. And indeed, ultimately, um, he published a book about that. Then he formed a collection of line engraved, and that again was very fine. He then went much more into the postal history angle. And this is really what this collection's about. Although it brings together a very sophisticated understanding of the link between the stamps, if they're on the envelopes, or if they're pre-adhesives, the background to what's going on. Now the collection itself has been exhibited quite widely internationally. It has always achieved large gold medals. And it also uh, has achieved a Grand Prix, which was in 2015. But one of his other collections, the Mulready one, achieved a Grand Prix in 2010. Now, Alan has also been recognized in the philatelic community. In 2017, he was asked to sign the role of distinguished philatelist. So this collection in many ways is a model of what can be done if you have three things. One is the ability to research your subject thoroughly. Secondly, to take advice on occasion. And thirdly, to have the resources to build it because this collection is not an ordinary collection of registered mail. It's probably one of the best, if not the best, that has ever been put together. On the other hand, the subject in this collection is only part of the story of registered mail. The post office in this country did not have an effective registered mail system for inland use until the January 1841. 
And that's where this collection begins. But of course, there was foreign arrangements. The actual um, foreign section of the post office handled registered mail coming into this country. But as far as this collection is concerned, the primary driving force at the beginning was to have an overall top class collection of inland registered mail covering a period up to uh, 1862. And the reason for that was that Alan was particularly interested, and I'll go into the rates very briefly in a minute, uh, just until that period. Now, with any luck, we will... Oh. Now that's who you should have been looking at. That is Alan. And as you can see, very distinguished looking guy. Um, he's also a fellow of the Catholic Society, which is not surprising. He joined that in 2002. Now this is unnecessary for most of you, but before we had an inland registration system here, we had many letters. The crazy thing, looking at it from a distance, is there was a system you paid double postage if you included valuables in the mail. There was no compensation arrangements, so theft was rife, and it was stopped on the 1st of January, 1840. On the other hand, uh, Roland Hill was very concerned that we should have a decent system. And roughly a year later, the shilling rate was introduced. It had to be paid in cash. And that lasted until 1848. On the 1st of March, the rate was halved. And that was halved because Hill had been essentially sacked from the post office by a guy called Maverley, who was very much a Luddite of the old military school, trying to run something that he thought he was running well, but nobody else did. And um, the rate was halved when Hill came back. It was halved to six months. Again, you still paid in cash. Then in 1850, there was a change in view, and they wanted to introduce the registration fee of sixpence being paid in stamps. And that was when you suddenly start to see quite a lot of strips of three of the 1841 uh, Tuckney Blue. And many of those strips come off registered. Blue. However, not everybody took any notice of that, and it still was possible to pay in cash, even though it theoretically was not allowed. That rate stayed in use until the 31st of July, 1862, when it was again reduced. And ultimately, on the 1st of January, 1878, it was halved again. The post office seems to have lost the plot recently. Nothing goes down, it always goes up, and the service is reduced. Also, in 1878, for the first time, compensation was paid, the magnificent sum of two pounds. And it subsequently, as the century went on, to higher level. Now we'll go into the collection. The slides you're going to see are my own personal choice of things that I think are interesting. Virtually everything in the collection is interesting. Some I find illustrate the changes uh, to a very uh, fine degree. I've had no instructions from Alan. So anything you're shown is completely me and I take the blame for it, all right? Now, there was a notice issued in December by the post office talking about the introduction of the service on the 6th of January. And it tells people a little bit about the service. They have to pay the shilling in cash. And the only exception was that you could send registered mail to France. Remember at this time,
Oh, sorry, yes, I see what's going on. I've been warned about that. Late visitors, you're welcome, but you're recorded as soon as you enter. Um, the, there's a second notice, which was dated a little bit later in 1841, which again stresses that you can pay letters to France and still have registration facility. Otherwise, they were only paid to the port of dispatch from the UK. Now, this next few things are going to talk about the shilling rate. Can, can you see there all right? I'm not standing in your way. Now, this is a good example of Alan's criteria for how he built his collection. He very much goes for the earliest possible usage known. And it um, will be seen that many of the things that I pick out are the earliest. This is the earliest inland letter registered letter known, and it's the uh, 15th of January. So it's quite soon after the six. You know, it's of course paid in cash, it's one of the tuppence, so it was a tuppence rate letter. Uh, you've changed the slide, but don't worry, I'll finish with that one. Now this is the first uh, registered letter which actually has an adhesive stamp on it. And this one is a little bit later, this is the 20th of January. This collection is extraordinary in that it has no less than seven examples of penny blacks paying the shilling registration rate. I don't think anybody has ever accumulated that number together. Funnily enough, I remember this particular one uh, first coming to the notice of the Philippines. And in fact, uh, it was first in the Pitchai collection before uh, it uh, moved to that. Why not pointing this at the right place, uh, Isabel? Here we've got a fantastic cover. It's got a pair of blues, shilling rate paid in cash. And this is the earliest registered, inland registered letter with the tubby blue reading for the issue of these. Alan was always very keen on Mulready's and he acquired this particular item some long time ago. It's the only registered Mulready uprated with an adhesive. So it's actually formally red postage. And again, it's perhaps difficult to see from the back that there's a shilling uh, manuscript. Term. The collection has got, I think, all the known registered examples of the Tupney Mulready. As far as I know, and as far as Alan knows, there don't seem to be any penny mulreddies which have been registered. Well, this won't show very well at the back, but in the top right of the envelope, you've got a penny pink embossed stamp, 1841 issue of a postal station. That intrinsically, at the shilling rate, is rarer than your penny blacks. It isn't, of course, as expensive these days, but the pure rarity, a Maltese cross shilling rate penny pink envelope, I can tell you it's pretty damn rare. And that's a beautiful example. And again, it's, it's quite rotating 42, but that's um, That's the Tupney Blue 1841 regist uh, envelope registration rate. There are two of these now. Um, the first one, uh, is in another collection, uh, and that um, came from uh, Vivian Sussex's collection of registered mail, which uh, was certainly a very fine collection. In many ways, you might think, well, it's not terribly impressive, but um, believe you me, it's uh, yeah. And it shows Alan's appreciation of the fact that postal station exists. That's something that I thoroughly approve of, of course, but there we are. Now this one, it's a little bit later, it's a pity the sun is up there, but that's got a triplet of the 1841 blue there, but it's a sixpenny rate, you can see the sixpenny uh, manuscript mark. The interesting thing about this cover is the box registered in blue. That is almost certainly a private hand stamp that was put on by whoever was sending. 
Now we're moving into the period where everything should be paid in advance and spent. This one I've chosen for two reasons. One is it comes from Guernsey, and now I will appreciate that fact. It also has at the left hand side a crown registered in blue. There are two known examples of that Guernsey one, it's quite distinctive. And it's a nice cover because it shows the registration uh, rate being paid in the triplet of companies and the postage rate being paid by the penny rates. Now, the embossed issue, which started in 1847, in Chile, uh, was designed for paying international overseas postage. It's very difficult to find it used in an inland mode. This particular cover, which has got a shilling on it, includes the stamp pays, the sixpenny registration fee, and sixpence postage. There are several examples of that known, and they're all to the Bank of Westmoreland. And so um, we have to be uh, very um, thankful for that. Now, we're coming into a period where these crown registered marks are used from a variety of towns. There are individual types. This particular one is from Liverpool. And I've chosen this cover because it also shows the only example of the spoon cancellation with registered within it. So it has a double thing, let alone the oval registered GPO mark. So it is a very attractive cover and it shows the different types of handling, the sixpenny rate being paid this time with service printed stamp, the cancellation with registered in it, the crown registered, and the receipt of the GPO. Now this cover, some people might think is relatively ordinary. It shows a special Lombard Street registered, and a box mark in red, I don't know how easy it is to see from where you are. But that is the finest strike of that mark I've seen. Normally it's very indistinct. I know it's indistinct here, but believe you me, that's a very fine strike. Otherwise it's a perfectly straightforward system of color. Now this one is really something else. This is the Norwich frame register at Norwich Norwich. Two examples known. This is the better one. Unfortunately, the scissors are a bit strong on the right hand of the penny, but that is no problem at all with a cover of this type. And that cover has been in a number of types. Now we've got an example again, uh, company rate, six penny registration rate and stamps. The red frame cancellation is from York. Now you see that cancellation in black. I won't say frequently, but it is well known. Even I have one, uh, but the red one is another matter. And so that's why I've chosen that one, even if it isn't the best striker we registered at York. This is another one. The left hand side of the cover shows registered at Glasgow. This is just one of a number of special town registered counts. Now we're going to look at going overseas. The collection structure, mail to Europe and then mail to other countries, continent by continent. So it's a very clear structure. Now the first cover is one of the most extraordinary covers in philately. It was sent by Victor Hugo, which is probably well known to you. He had a mild connection with Les Miserables, uh, amongst other things. This uh, cover is rated at uh, 14 shillings and sixpence. It's one of the highest frankings of the shilling in Bulls. There are three strips of four and a pair. The registration rate is paid by the solitary sixpence on the left. And that is a, it is a truly 
world-class, not only rarity, there's only one off, but it, in terms of interest, it is something probably approaching seven pounds rate in the book rate, folks. If you're interested, the catalog, the auction catalog will tell you the breakdown, but I, I'm sure most of you know it off of my heart anyway. But that is really something else. And although um, I have a modest collection of the bus covers, I don't have one that comes quite that much. Come on. I want to change it. Um, just the one. Just yeah, that one. I'm yeah. using that one. The other cover in this section I select is one going to Moscow. And here again, it's an exceptional franken. You don't find a lot of mail, registered mail in particular, that has survived uh, every cent. Now, this one. We've got uh, line prints in uh, the postage ranks. There's a sixpence registration. And then there's some additional charges for Russian registration. Some countries charge their own registered rates on top of the British ones. And that accounts, in all, as you can see, for a postage rate of eight and threepence. Beautiful cover. Again, this is an embossed cover. And I've chosen it because it's interesting. It's uh, in a period where the registration rate should be paid in stamps. The postage rate, two shillings, is paid in stamps. There's a charge mark in red, top of that, two shillings. And that was paid in cash. So it shows a post dated paid in cash uh, possibility. And that was allowed for foreign mail. It went on even for longer. Okay, a lovely country. Now we're going outside Europe and life gets in many ways just as spectacular, if but a little more complicated. Now this cover apparently came out of the Vatican archives. Donated by the Cardinal. All I can say is God alone knows what is also still in the archives or should be in the archives. It's a cover from uh, Almuts in Moravia. It's about 105 uh, crowns and 21 crowns registration. You can see the crown registration mark on the right hand side. It's addressed. Um, to uh, Cardinal of this country. Pick this one out. Can't go very wrong with capes. Well, this is a double rate letter going to Holland. And again, uh, it was charged two and five pence on the right hand side. It appears to be a penny overpaid. It's uh, got three shillings on it. There's uh, two shillings with a two green seated stamps, six penny rate with one of the triangles and five pence with the other one. So someone paid a penny over. There was probably very little else so could do. Now this one is particularly interesting. To be honest, it was a service I wasn't really aware of until quite recently. It's a cover going to Calcutta. And it's coming through Bombay. And on the left hand side, the bottom, there is a strike that says Express Paid Bombay. There was a possibility of an express service from Bombay to Calcutta, and that uh, took up two shillings. Now there's a, a strip of three shilling stamps there. That leaves one and threepence. Ninepence postage, sixpence registration, all included within it. Now we're getting into some pretty hairy stuff, uh, mixed franking in terms of denominations from Canada to England at the six penny rate. That cover is ex Hackney, but is now in Alan's collection and is one of the early Canadian covers. It isn't quite the earliest. That was a non cover. 
It's a beautiful thing. This one is ex -porous. And I'm particularly fond of it because before Alan had it, I actually had it. It is the only known block of four tempenies on cover and represents a quadruple eight plus six months registration to America. But a fantastic thing. It's very interesting to see what that fetches at the end of the day. Now we're getting into a different realm. We're in Australasia and Australia, or at least the states, New South Wales and Victoria, created a world first. They issued adhesive stamps purely to pay a registration. Now, other countries followed suit, not that many, but this is uh, from New South Wales. And on the left hand side, you've got a uh, stamp, shipping stamp, sorry, the six month stamp paying the registration fee. That is used on the second day of the issue of that stamp. So it's the earliest known in keeping with Alan's um, criteria of getting the earliest known. This one uh, comes from Victoria and the shilling stamps on the right. There's also a shilling stamp, blue one on the left, which is a double rate matter. And this in 1854 just shades the New South Wales this is the first uh, issue of a registration only at Egypt. Finally, the New Zealand cover, I think is visually tremendously attractive, and therefore I've included it. Uh, it's a fascinating combination, but all in all, it's still at the sixpenny rate. You've got to dissect the sixpence into the various postage rates. Well, that, ladies and gentlemen, is a very brief summary of some of the items in Alan's collection. I truly think it is one of the exceptional collections, and I hope you found that interested, interesting. If you have any questions, I won't guarantee to answer them, but I'll try. Thank you very much. Quite often written in red. I suspect it's tied in with the use of red for pavement. I can only say suspect because it also occurs in black quite often and occasionally in blue. But one of the key things is that that phrase registered letter. Um, I recently happened to see a cover where uh, at the end of the day it was concluded it was completely fabricated, where they'd slipped up and just put registered. And you won't just find registered very often, it's always registered letter. But I'm guessing that I think my assumption would probably be that the red is to indicate that it's been done. Yeah, that's right. They're pretty orthodox sometimes. Any, anyone else? I haven't the least idea, Gavin. It seems extraordinary. I only came to that conclusion when I realised that Alan hadn't got one. I haven't got one, but then I thought, I've never seen one. And I spoke to him about it, and he'd never seen one. Either. I just don't know. I suppose you could, this is speculation, that all the known registered Mulridges are Tutwoods, therefore they had an enclosure. And you could say, well, only things with enclosures were likely to be registered. But that is unsubstantiated speculation, but it might be wrong. Well, thank you very well, much. Well, thank you all thank very you. much. I wasn't expecting to do that, but it was quite fun, really. <laughs> Well, oh, that's just about enough half an hour, isn't it? Well, that's it. Yeah. Thank you so much. That's all right. You know, the problem there is the light.